This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company. For more information and links to all our great podcasts, visit HartmanMedia.com. Welcome to the American Monetary Association's podcast, where we explore how monetary policy impacts the real lives of real people and the action steps necessary to preserve wealth and enhance one's lifestyle. We're glad you're with us today. And today we is investment counselor Doug and myself. Doug, welcome back. How's it going? Always great to be back, Jason. Doug, it amazes me, and I know it amazes you, how many investors fall for the silliest things. Now, these aren't just mom and pop real estate investors. These are the investors who should be, as they say, the smartest guys in the room. And they should be super sophisticated. They shouldn't fall for manias and hype and mislabeling of investments. And what I mean by mislabeling is the company WeWork, a company that I told you all many episodes ago was essentially a sham. And boy, was I right, right? Just go back and listen to the episodes. You heard me talking about it months before it was in the the mainstream financial press. And uh, now everybody knows that the emperor has no clothes. They knew a couple of weeks ago. But how is it you can take an executive suite company, just like Regis? Regis is an old executive suite company that's been around for many, many years There's nothing new about this concept. As my favorite uh, book of the Bible, Ecclesiastes, says there's nothing new under the sun. This is the same old thing. Adam Newman, scam artist that he is, tried to stick a new label on it and call it a tech company. What a bunch of hype. Well, I think that the way that this comes about is that a lot of times you'll have something that starts out and they get around to venture capital funding. And they get a second round at a higher valuation and a third round at a higher valuation and then a fourth round. And then once people start seeing the valuations go up, then you start getting investors who just get on to try to ride the trend. It's amazing. Instead of because of any kind of underlying fundamentals. Exactly. I want to remind everybody of commandment number 21 in Jason Hartman's 10 commandments. <laughs> We're up to 21 now, Doug. I don't even know if you know this. Did you hear me announce commandment number 21 when we were in Savannah, Georgia at the Venture Alliance uh, retreat? I recall that there was a 21st from a prior (laughs) uh, podcast, but I don't remember off the top of my head what it was. Here it is. Commandment number 21 of my 10 commandments. Of course, I'm being snarky because we will be up to commandment number 32 eventually, I'm sure. Commandment number 21 is thou shalt avoid manias. Thou shalt avoid manias. And this was a mania. It was just a a silly mania, right? Yep, absolutely. Okay, go ahead. Keep on going. Now, Now, imagine when Doug is talking about venture capitalists and all of this stuff. Remember, you could be one of the people who invested in the fund where the venture capitalist is deploying your money into this completely silly, stupid business. So... This is your money, potentially, folks. Maybe you would have invested in this company. Maybe you're invested in one of these many other sham tech companies that doesn't make any money and probably has no chance of making any money. Continue. Well, in fact, actually, if anybody has a mutual fund with a, in a growth fund, there's a good chance that you have allocation to at least some of these sham companies because they all have extremely high price to earnings ratios or no price to earnings ratio because they don't have earnings yet. Right. They but have they're, the they're infinite it. PE yes. ratio. Yes. Yeah, the <laughs> infinite PE ratio or, or really high price to sales ratio, which is what they usually use for the companies without earnings. But then, you know, the way the cycle ends up going is that, yeah, people, they just start riding that mania. And then if it goes on long enough, people think, hey, this, this must just be how things work now. And then, of course, eventually bills have to be paid. And uh, if you're not producing any profits, then sooner or later, people are going to stop giving you more money and it all crashes eventually. But of course, what happens is that the way that, you know, almost everybody measures things is instead of looking at a full business cycle, which is five to 12 years, what they do is they look at one fiscal year at a time. So they'll say, hey, you know, we were, uh, you know, increased by 450% this year. Oh my God, there's a new paradigm. And they'll say, hey, it went up by 40% this year. 
and you know what you know what they won't say is hey you know we we have something that you know started out with say like three hundred thousand dollars in revenue and five hundred thousand dollars in cost and now they have thirty million in revenue and two hundred million in cost okay well they're actually getting worse over time you know the faster they grow the worse they're doing right. this is like what happened with Groupon you know the more they grew the worse their cash flow got yeah right. and you know at some point that comes unraveled it has yeah. to come unraveled. yeah absolutely absolutely you know the piper must be paid it reminds me back in 1998 1999 and 2000 all these people talking about the new economy the new economy oh it's all different now you can have you know a pe ratio of of 300 times earnings and this company is going to be viable because it's a tech company ooh you know doug as you and i have both said guess what folks real investments and real businesses make money yes yeah, exactly end of discussion Okay. In fact, I recall saying those exact words I know on this you did. podcast. I know, you did. I know. I know you did. I know. And I couldn't agree with you more. But listen, I would not be so incensed at this if I, you know, if someone called me up and they were an unsophisticated mom and pop investor and they said, hey, I invested in this deal and I lost money. I got suckered. But this is the whole institution. This is Wall Street. These are the as I said, the old saying, the smartest guys in the room, right? There's a, a movie about the Enron scam artists, scumbags, mm -hmm. who, by the way, are making their return, as we've talked about. And it's called The Smartest Guys in the Room. And, you know, it's just amazing that these people fall for this stuff. I mean, yeah. Doug, I'm incensed at it because... I could see if an unsophisticated person, but not not the institutions that are the icon of capitalism. I guess they fall for it, too. <laughs> yep. Well, in fact, I had a wonderful conversation with one of the folks at Profits in Paradise about this, because what happens is you know, all of these tech CEOs, they get onto a TED talk and they talk like they're changing the world or like, you know, they're what they're doing is special and has a, a critically important social mission. Because, of course, you know, clearly they're not about making money because they don't make any money. Well, I mean, they make plenty of money for themselves. <laughs> yeah, right. But, you know, they, they talk about how, about how you know, we are not concerned about making money. I go, well, clearly, because your investors aren't making any money yeah. unless they could resell the shares because yeah, right. there's no profits to distribute. But I think that that's how the scam goes is they get people emotionally involved because they think that somehow they're changing the world. Whereas the thing is that voluntary exchange changes the world for the better on its own, mm -hmm. you know, because right. you know, by definition of voluntary exchange without coercion or externalities has to benefit both sides. Otherwise, there'll be no transaction. Yeah. You use the word externalities, which is an interesting term in economics. And what externalities are, usually they're applied to environmental issues, because if a, uh, a company produces widgets and it pollutes the nearby river, it doesn't necessarily pay for the pollution it creates. Sometimes it exactly. does, but not necessarily. And so that's what's called an externality. It's, in other words, a cost of running that business, even though the business doesn't actually bear the cost. People have many times criticized Walmart for this. And now, finally, they're coming around and criticizing Amazon. Rightfully so. Amazon deserves a lot of criticism, as great as it is. And, you know, but it also deserves a lot of criticism, too. And the way they would criticize Walmart is they would say that basically Walmart wasn't paying people enough. And Walmart is using the welfare state to support its business model, because a lot of Walmart workers were receiving some sort of government aid uh, in one way or another. And that was considered an externality of Walmart's business that Walmart was not paying for. Any thoughts? I'm sure you want to expand on that, but I just wanted to give you a tee it up. I think you could actually take that even further now because Dollar General probably has taken that model and pushed it even deeper because there's a lot of small towns that have uh, Dollar General penetrated in and it's uh, pushed a lot of the even smaller mom and pop places. Mm -hmm. Because I think there is some merit to that Walmart argument. However, you know, as you're fond of saying, it's compared to what? And you, you have to say, okay, well, if Walmart wasn't there, how would the community composition be without Walmart and then with Walmart? Because mm -hmm. as low as you might get paid at Walmart, I would assume that if you had a better option, you'd probably take it. Absolutely. Yeah, that's what we've got to assume, that it, each each person or each player, a company too, companies and people, in a mm -hmm. capitalist system are going to get the benefit 
of the best bargain they can get. Absolutely. But still, the externalities are very real, I think, especially when it comes to things like pollution. And as much as I don't like the idea of getting hysterical over climate change, I think climate change is real and you know, there's something that needs to be done about it. Now, my preference would be to, to just make it simple and just put a tax on carbon emissions and then to sponsor more nuclear power. You know, one of the things that businesses are very, very good at is running away from costs. So the second you make something more expensive, all the smart accountants figure out how to minimize, minimize it as much as humanly possible. <laughs> they sure do. They Sure. Do. Exactly. Yeah. Businesses are very, very good at running away from cost. So then it's like if you can just align the cost of the externalities, a lot of times the market mechanism can solve a lot of problems without a lot of top down intervention. OK, good. I think we talked this one through. The moral of the story here is, folks, just don't be fooled by the resume and the size of the institutions endorsing or promoting any investment Use your own common sense and let common sense rule the day. Good old-fashioned common sense is worth a lot. All this talk about, you know, these highfalutin esoteric terms that companies and CEOs and people are using and, and the financial media is using are usually just a bunch of BS. They're just usually BS. And final comment on that, and let's move on. Final comment there is that it's just that things that make sense are always going to make sense. And there's always going to be somebody trying to push some new idea, some new paradigm to try to sucker you into throwing a bunch of money after an idea that was never viable to begin with. Yeah. That was actually a lot of our topic of our conversation is that, you know, people, these uh, tech CEOs get people all emotional about their nonsense business models to get them to stop thinking. Well, right. if people just keep thinking, then you're know, not saying you'll never lose money, but it's very unlikely you're going to go bankrupt because yeah. you're not going to put enough in to where it can crush you. Absolutely. Please keep thinking. <laughs> That's good. Okay, <laughs> Doug, one of the great things that you did again was you played a brand new version of the Creating Wealth simulation game. It was a lot of fun, just as it was last year. Last year, we were in Hawaii for Profits in Paradise, and you were just super entertaining. If the real estate thing doesn't work out for you, you can always get a job as a racetrack announcer, Doug. I want you to know that. Or maybe an auctioneer. I think you'd be great at either one of those things. <laughs> yeah, I, I'd actually uh, considered making the Creating Wealth simulation where uh, you had to auction off properties to the different teams to see who would bid the highest for a certain market and cash flow. That would be hard to administer, but it would make it really fun. You know, we played the game at Profits in Paradise again, and it was very educational. It was also very entertaining, but it was definitely very educational. Now, I want you to explain what this game is to our listeners, and let's help them learn some of the lessons, even if they weren't in attendance. And if they were, we'll just kind of reiterate some of those lessons, or maybe some of the lessons weren't fully internalized by the attendees. So either way, whether you were there in attendance or not, I think this uh, little chat about it will be beneficial to you. Go ahead. Sure. So the way the game works is that we split the room into teams and each team had a list. It was a hypothetical list of properties, but most of them were modeled based off pro formas from the Jason Hartman website. And so what we did was we said, hey, we have different markets, different providers and different properties. And what we want each team to do is to build what they think is their best portfolio with a given amount of money based on a balance of cash flow and appreciation. And so what people were doing was figuring out, okay, how much do I wanna put down? Do I wanna put down 15, 20, or 25%? What are my closing costs? You know, which ones are gonna be more cash flow weighted? Which ones are gonna be more appreciation weighted? Because the cash flow weighted properties will be more resilient, but your long-term returns are usually lower than your appreciation weighted properties, but appreciation properties tend to be more volatile. So basically, it's how do you build your best overall portfolio with a given amount of capital based on all of the moving parts. The thing that uh, a lot of people really took out of this or, or really liked about it was that they got really deep into figuring out, okay, exactly how much cash do I need to build a given portfolio? Because most people view, look at their, view their investments or look at their housing purchases one at a time. So they'll go out and buy one house. Then they'll go out and buy another house. But if you think about it from an overall portfolio perspective, you would say, okay, how much capital do I want to put into this portfolio? How do I want to deploy that capital? How do I want to split it out between market areas? You know, it's like, for example, 
if I'm self-managing, if you're self-managing, you would realistically want to concentrate your properties in a smaller number of areas so you can get some economies of scale. Right. And, and so that's one of the optimization vectors. And by the way, Doug, I talked about this. I'm pretty sure you were out of the room when I talked about this. I brought it back from a long ago creating wealth simulation game. It was the four optimization vectors and one of them being management efficiency. Correct. And so that was actually one of the other options that we had was deciding whether to self-manage or not. And the whole idea was that when all of these portfolios were entered, each of the properties was simulated, actually honestly using random numbers. So because one of the people said, okay, can you tell me how it's going to turn out? And I said, no, I can't because I use a random number generator with a probability distribution to forecast the performance because the future is uncertain, right? Just because it says 6% growth on a pro forma doesn't mean it's going to be 6%. It could be anywhere from negative five to positive 20. Or any other or any 6%. other metric on that performa, yeah. by the way. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so that's the thing is that, you know, in injecting some randomness, what it does is it helps to see that you'll have random factors that'll push things up and down and you'll have things that are that are moving around. But if you have an overall portfolio built, you'll be much more stable than if you just have a single property or if you just have a whole bunch of properties all concentrated in a single market. Okay, good. So, you know, remember, these are conflicting optimization vectors many times, right? Like management efficiency would dictate that you want all your properties in one market, in one area, so that it's sort of easy to manage them. But then you don't have optimization vector for diversification. And so you want to balance these things. You know, look, everything in life is a trade-off, right? So you want to have some diversification optimization and some management efficiency optimization. And the thing you want to do is just find the right blend of these things. And, and of course, there are more vectors like optimization for portfolio size, et cetera, et cetera, or, mm -hmm. you know, overall cash flow return on investment, you know, tax savings. I mean, you could, there's like an endless list of optimization vectors. But, okay, so we don't know what's going to happen with the property. We take our best stab at it when we pick and we make a choice. What else, Doug? Another thing that I think that really came out of this simulation that a lot of people that was educational for a lot of people was that the teams that did the best had a combination of appreciation markets, you know, markets that tended to appreciate faster, but didn't necessarily have as much cash flow and cash performance markets, you know, markets that tend to be more linear but uh, we'll have higher uh, cash performance ratios. Uh, it, the way we would say it in Jason Hartman vernacular would be hybrid markets and linear markets, or as I called it, the flashy, trashy portfolio methodology, just tongue in cheek. But to that point, a lot of people you know, found it really illustrative that a combination of hybrid markets that will, you know, when the economy goes up, will really be able to ride that upside wave, but can still self-finance the cost of carrying their debt combined with the cash flow markets will make it so that when there's a correction, they can ride it through. But then when the sun shines, they can make hay. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a good strategy for most investors because, right, we don't know when the expansion is going to stop. It could go for one more year, three more years, five more years. We don't know when the recession is going to be or how long it's going to be. You know, we know that there will be a recession. We know it'll start. We know it'll end. We know there'll be an expansion that starts, has a middle and end, and there's going to be another recession at some point. But we don't know what any of those numbers are going to be. So what you want to do is you really want to build a portfolio that's going to give you exposure, positive exposure to all of those ups and downs. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Okay. So how do you do it? I mean, what do you do? You say that and everybody's nodding their yep. head saying, okay, sounds good to me, Doug. I agree. So in that case, then essentially what you do is you segment out your places to invest to say, okay, of all of the, you know, say our hybrid markets in the portfolio, which ones speak to me the most? And then say of all the linear markets that are available, which ones of those speak to me the most or which ones do I feel the most comfortable with? Or the way that I look at it is not just the market, but which provider do I feel the most comfortable with? Because I, I can tell you that if you're working through an investing partner, if you have somebody who's good, that makes your life a whole heck of a lot easier. It's Sure does. You know, as I'm fond of saying, right, a good provider can't turn a bad property into a good deal, but a bad provider can turn a good property into a bad deal. Right. But that's one of the other things to really think about is who are you going to be working with? Because that is going to be really critically important over a given amount of time, because especially when you're really starting out, it's 
critically important to make sure that you're working with somebody who is of really high quality. Because if you stumble on your first steps out of the gate, there's two things that can happen. I think one, it will create a serious detriment to your long-term compounding. And then number two is that it will make you really gun-shy and paranoid, being worried that something's waiting behind every bush to bite you. I would say that that is probably the biggest danger is how it affects our own psychology as investors. You know, the investors uh, or just people in general in life that get on in the world and become successful are the ones who can let things roll off their back like the metaphorical water on the duck's back, right? And, you know, you take it, you learn the lesson, you get up, you dust yourself off, and you move forward with gusto. And, you know, those those are the people that, that win the game, whether it be investing or just life in general. But, you know, Doug, you have two kids, and I know that as a parent, you've always got to balance these things. You know, you you want to spoil your kids, you want to protect them, you want to do everything for them, but... That's not really good for the kids because you need to make them self-sufficient and teach them how to fend for themselves because you're not always going to be there to fend for them, right? Even though you might want to do that, you got to let them fall down a little bit, right? Exactly. And anybody who says that they know exactly the right thing to do at any given time isn't doing it themselves. because. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, you mean like the WeWork CEO? (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Yes, exactly. To say, yes, I'm I'm going to change the world by by leasing office space and then releasing it not for a profit. No, but Doug, he is changing the world because because they have coffee and beer. That's that's <laughs> yeah, exactly. that's the and new the, economy. The, the new economy is about coffee and beer, apparently. <laughs> uh, which I I'm a fan of both of those things. I am both pro coffee and pro beer. Um, <laughs> Me too. They're okay. I'm I'm good with both of them, especially. My, my name is Doug Utberg, and I approved of this message. Yep. <laughs> You've got that German blood in use of the beer, yes. right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> exactly. All right. Exactly. Okay, so back to the uh, investing. Yeah, back to the topic. (laughs) So back to investing. The thing is, what we're talking about is are just things that make sense. And I think what the portfolio thing, where that gets really important, is that when you're starting out, let's say you have zero properties, right? Say you have a primary residence, or say you don't have a primary residence, right? You're starting out and you have zero properties. And you say, okay, over, say, the next three to five years, I think I'm going to build a portfolio of about X. Well, figure out about what you think that's going to look like and about how you think it's going to perform once it's stabilized. So because then what you can do is if you end up having a short term setback, you can say, all right, I'm just at a step toward my overall portfolio. And once I get to the end point, I'm not going to have to worry about these little fluctuations, Mm -hmm. you know, because if you have a single property, you know, then however it performs is how it performs. If it performs good, you're awesome. If it has problems, then you're depressed. But, you know, if you have 10 properties, then any problem you have in any one property, unless it's a really, really big problem, probably won't be that detrimental to your overall performance. Yeah, that's true. So you you want to have those optimization vectors, and that's yep. the diversification optimization. Otherwise, uh, you know, it's related to, but not exactly the law of large numbers, right? Which we've talked about on the show before many times. And, and hey, that's how casinos make money, the law of large numbers, right? So. And I think that is exactly related to the law of large numbers. And, you know, you don't actually need that large of numbers for it to really matter because ordinarily, right, you know, say if you're talking casinos, you know, you have hundreds to thousands of people who are all playing the different floor games and it all averages out you in, know, the, in the favor by a of the house. house. Advantage. Yeah, yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. But on the other hand, you know, you can recognize a pretty significant benefit with really just a handful of properties, mm-hmm. you know, especially if they're diversified ac- across a couple of markets. You know, it doesn't take like 50 properties. It doesn't even take 30. Probably, I mean, 10 will get you in pretty good shape. And even five, you'll have pretty decent level out. So that's the thing is that it's getting through that initial fear of volatility while you're building up your portfolio until it gets to the point to where any one property doesn't represent that big of an overall swing in the performance. Absolutely. You know, because yeah, you're gonna have some vacancies, you're gonna have some evictions, you, you'll have some tenants who create damages, but it probably won't happen in all of them at once. Right, very, very unlikely that that would be the case. 
Good stuff. Any final thoughts on that? We got to wrap it up for today. Just that I'm already uh, jotting down ideas to make the Meet the Master simulation even better. And Can't so wait. I just want everybody who's listening to book your tickets for Meet the Masters. Well, and, well uh, wait, whoa, 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 whoa. Uh, you well, can't book them yet. Okay. okay. Book so your tickets just, when they just are available. Make, for Meet make the a mental note. Okay. <laughs> we are not yet announcing our date or location for Meet the Masters, but it is coming soon. So stay tuned for that. It won't be long. At an undisclosed future time and location. Yes, yes. During the fiscal year of 2020. <laughs> <laughs> during, during the spring of the fiscal year. 2020 the spring of the fiscal year of 2020 <laughs> actually the calendar some... year 2020 which is the same as the fiscal year in this case <laughs> just to yes, get yes, during some time between january 1st and december 31st ah, in 2020 it'll be the spring <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> good stuff or or generally the spring maybe a little bit before spring so uh good sometime during the months of february to april yes. most likely yes 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 it's coming. possibly but not specifically Yes. Yeah, yeah. We we want to make a lot of disclaimers, as many as those Wall Street investment houses do. You know, tons of disclaimers. <laughs> so there so you also, go. Yeah, and now we have to play tech CEO, and we're going to change the world with a new paradigm. That's uh, you know, new economy. The old rules don't apply anymore. I, if everybody can't tell that I'm being facetious, yes, I'm completely we're, we're being smoke. completely <laughs> snarky here, folks. But makes sense, yeah. Just so you get the idea. Well, Doug, this has been interesting. Thanks for coming on today, and. Uh, listeners. Thanks for joining us and go to jasonhartman.com for more info. And by the way, I have to just remind you every once in a while, if you have not recently, or especially if you have not ever watched the free video on the front page of jasonhartman.com, which will teach you in 27 minutes how to analyze a real estate investment make sure you do that. Do yourself a favor. If you want to really understand how to analyze a deal on the front page of jasonhartman.com, there's a great video for you. Go check it out. And if you haven't listened to that lately, make sure you're watching that every six months or so. Okay, Doug, thanks again. And until tomorrow, listeners, happy investing. Thank you so much for listening. Please be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss any episodes. Be sure to check out the show's specific website and our general website, hartmanmedia.com, for appropriate disclaimers and terms of service. Remember that guest opinions are their own. And if you require specific legal or tax advice or advice in any other specialized area, please consult an appropriate professional. And we also very much appreciate you reviewing the show. Please go to iTunes or Stitcher Radio or whatever platform you're using and write a review for the show. We would very much appreciate that. And be sure to make it official and subscribe so you do not miss any episodes. We look forward to seeing you on the next episode.